Doctor Experience. I'm your host, Jeanette Lissette. And today's guest is Jody Wellman. Jody is a leading authority on living lives worth living. As a speaker and facilitator, she helps her clients live squander free lives while they're lucky enough to be above ground, while cleverly beginning with the end in mind. She named her company 4,000 Mondays because it shines the light on the finite number of weeks we have to live like we mean it. Jody holds a master's degree in applied positive psychology from the University of Pennsylvania, where she also is an assistant instructor. As a certified coach with 25 years of corporate leadership, Jody helps executives, teams, and high performers work well and live life even better. Jody, welcome to the Next Chapter Experience. Well, thank you so much, Jeanette. I'm excited to be here with you. I'm excited to talk to you because I caught up with you on TEDx and I thought, oh my God, first of all, to have the courage to do that. Oh, thank you. I still feel the butterflies. I still feel them. They're floating in there still. How was that experience? Oh, it was dreamy. And I'll be honest, it was a dream to have been given the opportunity. And I said to myself, knowing that I had five month lead time, I said, I want to consciously choose how this period of time is going to be. So I said, I want this to be a pleasure. I actually said, I want it to be a delight. So I used the words delight and pleasure on purpose so that even in the moments where I was stressing about not memorizing all the words, I thought this is a pleasure that I get to struggle to memorize all these words. So it was all, it was choosing my mindset, put it that way. It was a lot of fun. It was just beautiful. In fact, I could feel your confidence as you were getting comfortable with the stage and even your body posture. And I enjoyed listening, but I also enjoyed watching you because you were in your element. You oh, were in your thank you so much. And can I just share really quickly with you, Jeanette, that I had a funny experience where I went out on the stage and started the talk and about a minute in my mic cut out and I was summoned backstage. And I thought, what on earth is happening here? And I go back and apparently my earrings were causing interference with the mic. And so I had to go out and restart in front of 700 people. Wow. And and the videos. And so it was a funny thing you were saying, like getting my element is that I had a chance to do it for a minute first and then come back out and do it again. Wow. They appreciated it. I could tell by the, all the applause at the very end, because it was actually extremely thought provoking and almost disturbing from a certain standpoint in terms of the 4,000 Mondays we get in the average life expectancy of 80 years. So when I heard that, what came to mind was 5,500, 600 minutes. That's what was echoing in my head, which is the number of minutes we have in a year. And when I heard the 4,000 Mondays and that song popped into my head from the Broadway play Rent, and I started to think, I said, that is just so profound to think about it that way. And it does cause you to think, mm. what am I doing with time? <laughs> That's the thing I get excited about is that, is it a little bit morbid? Absolutely. But if it grabs our attention, then I do think it's worth it. And when we do the countdown, which I'm a little hell bent on forcing everyone to do, it really does wake us up. And fortunately, research backs it up. I always find it convenient when research backs up the points we want to make. And that when we do see something Thing like life bound by limits of time, it is more rare. And then when we see rare things, we treat them a little more preciously than we do if we think that it's going to go on forever. I've always liked the thought experiment of imagine for a moment that you knew you were never going to die. You were going to live for infinity, millions and billions and trillions and forever years. I don't know about you, and I'm curious how you think about it. Actually, how, what does it feel like to you to think you will never, ever die? That's an interesting question. And for me, I know that you had an experience experience where you lost your mom at, uh, and she was at an early age. So more than likely you were at an early age as well, relatively speaking. Well, my mother is very elderly right now. Okay. And I have a girlfriend whose father is very elderly. And we've had conversations about the reality that they both know that the end is near. And sometimes it seems like they make a decision okay. when they want to go when oh. they reach a certain age. So that got us both thinking, what are we doing with the time that we have? Yeah. So when I think about that, I thought more about longevity Yeah. because mostly what I focus on is mindset, wellness, and wealth. And for me, the wellness piece is mm. grounded in longevity. And I mm. think about what do I want to look like when I'm 60, when I'm 70, when I'm 80, when I'm 90, what do I want to be mm. at those ages? I think about the preparation of 
what it will take for me to live a robust life at later ages. So that's what I think about mostly. Yeah. Yeah. I like the way you put that. Who do I want to be? There's a lot of effort that we place around the doing and the doing can be very important. And we'll probably talk more about that. All the fun things we'd love to do in our life. And I like your perspective though, the it's almost like the being, who's the person I want to be at those ages. Yeah. And so then can we reverse engineer it? How do we look at it and say, if I get to be so as women we get to roughly be 83 hopefully a lot longer women sorry men reach roughly 78 and so that's where 4,000 weeks is roughly in the middle of that zone of 80 and when you think about hopefully longer than 83 but I like your perspective of if I want to be this kind of person if I backtrack it by every five or ten years like what do I need to be thinking about what are my priorities what do I need to take on with urgency that's it in a nutshell it truly is because at a younger age when I wasn't focused on mindset and I wasn't focused focused on what was really important to me, what mattered. It was just day to day, Monday through Friday, the 48 hours I get on the weekends. And then again, the cycle begins. And then you're trying to prove yourself in the environments that we are, if you're a higher achiever and all that kind of stuff. And after a while, it's like, what do I really want? What's really important to me? And that's when I started spending more time in personal development and really trying to come to grips with who do I want to be? And things shifted for me when I started to spend more time in that development space. Mm -hmm. Since that time, it, it just seems that, in fact, I had this conversation with a friend of mine. I'm a completely different person oh. than I was, I would say 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. Oh. I'm a completely Con different person. Wow. And consciously so from deliberate yeah. steps. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I think think that has changed is my perspective on sometimes life, but on everyday things. Mm -hmm. I'm less caught up in the problem things and more mm -hmm. focused on the solution. I first find that a lot of people are caught up on the problem. This is what's wrong. That's what's wrong. That's what's wrong. That type of thing. And I'm just not, I'm thinking, and I do say, now that you have that down pack in terms of the problem, <laughs> let's talk about solutions. <laughs> I, I'm just not stuck there. I'm just not. Oh, stuck is the key word. Cause that is is such a mired place for a lot of people is they admire the problem and they want to stop and obsess over why they're a victim or whatnot. And I agree. I share the same, I think, kind of way of living as you as part of it is that like life's too short to just get caught up in why it's not great. Let's just try and find a way to make it. Maybe it's not going to be great. Maybe there's a situation that is never going to be great, but we could at least make it not terrible. And you, when you were just describing that, Jeanette, it reminded me of all the research and many of us probably know people people personally, I know I do, who have had some kind of exposure to death. It could be because they had a really rough medical diagnosis, for example. And the studies are so fascinating to me that the people have a renewed sense of life and kind of vim and vigor for life. And it's more than just that they want to say, I want to go out and have fun. It's that they recalibrate their priorities. So you just started to say, I got less interested in the problems and it reminded me of these people who I believe have been given a precious gift of a, of a wake up call, they reportedly say, you know what, all the trivial stuff just doesn't matter to me anymore. Or the one that's my favorite is that I just care less about what people think of me. What you just and, said. And I, I think, can I get more of a dose of that, please? In the face of death, and Steve Jobs has a way better quote that I'll ever remember eloquently to say and quote him on that in the face of death, all that silly little stuff just falls away because we get so caught up in the minutia and about little things that don't matter. And so that's what I want us to do is to stop and say, how many Mondays do you have left? And does that not give you the perspective of, oh, that silly nagging email in my inbox is really getting to me. You know what? Does it really matter? I, my thoughts went there. And that's why I decided that it was time for me to leave the corporate environment. Because for me, there was a lot of minutia. It uh, was a lot of chatter. There was just a lot of all this stuff that didn't matter. And I just got sick of it. And they would make moans out of molehills. And I would just tell my folks, you need to relax. A conversation. Exactly. But even now, as I talk with people and they are caught up in the news and commentary and yeah. all these things that they cannot control, I just have a hard time absorbing all of that energy 
and then letting that bring me down. So I've developed a way of staying informed, but not getting too caught up in what I can't control. In fact, it was Darren Hart. I was listening to one of his talks and he was talking about as entrepreneurs, we can spend our time in the news and getting caught up in things that we cannot control, but we would be better off shifting a little bit and looking at what we can control to make our lives better. Oh, beautifully said, beautifully repeated. Some people will be more fixated on on what isn't working and whereas you naturally gravitate to yeah but what is or what could we do to fix that thing rather than getting stuck i get really frustrated with people around me that do that too and i do need to remind myself about our natural tendency as human beings to have this negativity bias because the negative stuff is just naturally so much stickier and it's rooted of course in the back in the cave days where we needed to pay attention to danger oh yeah that's fine but i do think we need to consciously override that system because some people have a way more nagging default that they will go there and some of us don't but we all have to stop and say where am i spending my time thinking right now and that's really the way i want to spend because again back to the way i look at life if i was to croak tonight would i really want to look back on today and think that i gave 15 full minutes to to bitching and moaning about some kind of a pesky situation no in a nutshell now i had a podcast guest recently. And one of the topics she brought up was what she coined as toxic positivity. So when I was reviewing your background, and I saw that you have this master's degree in applied positive psychology, I wanted to talk to you about what that is. Yeah. Yeah, I love talking about it and I love debunking toxic positivity. I love the definition of positive psychology as the scientific study of what makes life worth living. There are different ways to put that. It's really the scientific study of well-being and how individuals and organizations and systems can thrive. All that sounds great. And it is great. And I think a lot of people do get caught up in the idea that it is about slapping on a happy face or looking for the sunshine and rainbows on dark days. And I think it's a myth. I think that people like to be reductive. And unfortunately, that's not what it's about. And there's some misunderstanding. And so ultimately, the real point of it is positive psychology is about leveraging what is good in the world and the dark sides of reality in order to try and find our best way forward using our strengths and what's good around us in order to live lives that will help us flourish. And my choice, for example, in researching and making this topic of mortality as a motivator, my thesis is a full on example of how that's the dark side, right? Death. Who wants to talk about the fact that we're temporary other than me? Wait a sec. There is an upside to it. Just like how I will say that by tuning into and confronting death, hopefully not imminent sense of mortality, that can be this animating condition for life. Similarly, meaning is a huge study of well-being, finding meaning and purpose. It's a huge aspect of what makes us feel like we are living lives that matter. And one of the best ways, even though we wouldn't really ask for it, but to make meaning is through hardship and struggle. Because it's through the dark days and the tough times that we start to realize what matters or what we're made of or whom we can connect with and maybe who we can't. And you need the cloudy and the stormy and the hurricane days in order to live life well. And so you know, there's actually a full embrace of bring it all on and, and trust that we can handle it because resilience, which is a huge chunk and topic and part of the curriculum of positive psychology, resilience is about facing the unfortunate crap that life throws at us. And so it's all part of it. It's all part of the cacophony and the stew of life. I love that it's not all sunshine. I can appreciate that. And I smile when I'm thinking about what you just said, because it reminded me of some of the valleys that I've had in my life. And I would always ask, my, what was the lesson in that? Something I was expecting to have a certain outcome just mm. simply did not go according to what I thought was the plan. And mm. I would have to only learn a lesson in those opportunities. And I learned not to be too hard on myself when the outcome wasn't what I expected. Simply, mm -hmm. what is the lesson in this? Mm -hmm. It's got to be something I'm supposed to learn from this mm -hmm. situation. But again, it was just being conscious in that moment and thinking in that moment, okay, this is happening for a reason. How you respond today is different from how you would have 10 years ago or possibly even 10 days ago. And we are able to consciously stop and say, like you said, I can't stop thinking of your words earlier. Like, how do I want to be in my 70s, in my 60s, and so on? And you get to shape more of it 
than I think we think. And I think that's one of the components of positive psychology is that some of us think that, well, this is our lot in life. And they say that 50% of our sense of happiness or our subjective life satisfaction, 50% of it is genetic. And we can curse our parents or be happy that they were cheerful people, but our lot in life is generally 50% because of them. But what that leaves then is another 50%. And they say that it's really roughly only 10% of our circumstances that dictate whether or not we're going to be happy people. And a lot of us will argue with that. We'll say, oh, I grew up in the projects or I had these abusive relationships or I suffered from addiction or lots and lots of fill in the blanks. But it is only 10% that's going to dictate our experience. That is the circumstance. And what that leaves us is with 40% is within our complete control to consciously choose how do I want to be right now? What can I do to get myself into a more productive and or positive frame of mind so I can enjoy this experience right now or so that I can enjoy this day or this visit with my dad or this, etc. So much is within our control. And I find that quite frankly, in, like intoxicating with possibility. No, it is because your percentages are dead on for that situation. And I'll explain mm-hmm. why in a second, but I was visiting with a, a doctor and trying to get to a certain level of wellness. And he uh, he said to me something like, Jeanette, he said, your health is about 40% genetics and 60% what you're going to do about it. So that kind of reminded mm-hmm. me of that. But in mm-hmm. essence, you mentioned how you were raised. Yeah, you can make that an issue of didn't have a dad, didn't have a mom, grew up yeah. in the projects. I actually grew up in the projects in the Bronx in New York. Okay. I know what that life is like. As a child, you just really don't have a sense of the impact of something like that. Yeah. But what I do know is that it doesn't define who you are or who you will become. Okay. So recently I I did a Google or I put in my address of the building that I lived in and I got a photograph of that building and I sent it to somebody that I I have been working with. And she says, a star is born. But it all began there. It all began in this building in the Bronx. But the bottom line is that life is truly what you make it, no matter what your circumstances are. Mm -hmm. So I find that fascinating when I talk to certain people and they say, I was disadvantaged and this and that. I think, you know what? A certain age, and I know this to be true from my own personal experience, Mm -hmm. I made a decision of what I wanted my life to be. And it wasn't that we were disadvantaged. Other people may have looked at it that way, Mm -hmm. but we made the best of what we had. But I also knew that at a certain age, it would be up to me. It wasn't my mom. It wasn't my dad. It wasn't the circumstances. I had the authority and agency to make the biggest impact in my own life. Mm -hmm. I just knew Mm -hmm. that intuitively as a young person. What do you think got you to realize that? Being observant, because I was always a shy child. I didn't talk a lot. I was always observing people, probably because I was so insecure and didn't have a lot of exposure. So I would just watch people. And I would, for some reason, make these, not really comparisons, but I would look and I would really see what was there. And then I became a reader. I have an older sister who is unbelievable when it comes to reading. And she just reads everything on the face of the earth. So I started to model her. I'm not a reader like she is to that extent, but I saw that there are things that are possible. There were things that are possible. And I knew that if I did my best, then it would count. And Uh I never forgot that if I just did my best, I wasn't Mm. always the best at everything, but if I just gave it my best effort, Mm. I simply gave it my best effort from elementary school to junior high school to high school. I gave it my best effort and it always had a great outcome. I never forgot this because I wanted to go to a specific college in Pennsylvania, Drexel University. And uh, in order to get accepted, I had to take an extra trigonometry course. To Sorry. I mm. had to go to night school in order to get that course done so that it would count. Oh. And I did it. Can you imagine going to night school with all these adults? I didn't oh. know what the hell was going on. I got there, I got the grade, turned it in and got a scholarship. Okay. But the oh. thing is that I did what I had to do. Yeah. Yeah. You used the word agency earlier that you became acutely aware of as a youngster that is rare because most adults don't necessarily stop and to consider. I have a tremendous sense of agency and this is Back to some of your words earlier, I just love our conversation because I love the points that you bring up that about what's within control and not in our control. And because so much is, why not consciously stop 
and design it. And I think we let life pass us by because we're busy and because we adapt fast and furiously and we get swept up by other distractions and we don't necessarily take responsibility for this precious gift, which is I could make the rest of this year pretty epic if I wanted. And I should qualify because I think epic is obviously a very big feeling word. It doesn't have to be epic. I don't have judgment if it's not epic. I love a quiet night in. I, I'm not saying things have to be crazy, but epic for you, right? Whatever that means. It could mean I want to read a book every five days. And that might be a really cool thing for you in your life. And you can do that. Or you can enroll online for one of those massive open online courses for free and learn about really cool things that mystify you. Or the list can go on and just don't even get me started because like my heart rate is just out of this world here. I love this stuff. But we do have the ability to shape it and that's the thing I think, well, let's get on with that. But what if we didn't have 4,000 Mondays? Many of us are well past our halfway point. But what if we didn't have the 4,000 in total? One of the things that drives me, and I admit that it's a motivation driven by fear, but I guess so many are, is the thought about getting to the end and having the pangs of regret about the things I didn't do. Yeah. Because I have a feeling you have a ton of things too, because you're a creative soul. You've got all sorts of ideas and things you're into. And that feel, and we're never going to get to all of it. So like, obviously we have to accept that our idea list of fun things to do in this life. We're not going to get to all of it, but we know the things that really would irk us at the end versus just a mild, oh, well, I didn't get to go to Vienna. Oh, no big deal. I've been there. <laughs> have you? Okay. For some reason, more motivated on my list to go now. But I think getting to the end and feeling that feeling to me would feel truly heartbreaking. And I think many of us have different versions of that. And so again, back to the, well, we can prevent that. We can prevent the regrets from actually flushing out. We could of course correct them now. Yeah, yeah. First of all, your website is just beautiful. Thank you. But you had me at figure out your number. And I'm like, I am not putting my number in there. I took the quiz. Okay. I got that. Cause I kept on scrolling down and then you had the countdown. Yeah. And I thought, do I really want to know how many Mondays I have? I thought to myself, first of all, I'm going to live beyond 80 so I can tack on a couple of more Mondays. <laughs> yes, yeah. I figured that out. Exactly. You get bonuses. That's allowed. Yep. <laughs> I figured that out. But I thought to myself, I said, gosh, this is daunting to think about it that way. Because it's just like Steve Jobs said, death is life's change agent. Mm -hmm. Knowing that we all, like you said in your TED Talk, we all are going to die. That's the reality. But you know what? Here's the thing for me. When I talk to people about their aspirations, and many mm. of them have these grand things that they want to do, I have to jump out of a plane. I have to do, I'm like, I'm not trying to do any of that stuff. <laughs> oh, I love that. Can I ask, can I be nosy? What's an example of something that would make you feel like life was getting lived? For me, it's the simple things. I love going to the beach and mm. I love sunsets and I love sunrises. Mm. I love my dog. Mm. I wish she would live forever or as long as uh, I would live. I wish we could live yeah. long together. I love to get up early in the morning and not be rushed. I love to enjoy a cup of coffee and listen mm. to Native American flute music and not Ooh. feel rushed. Oh. I want peace. But the number one thing on my list is to be well enough to enjoy those kind of things. That's the thing. That's the main mm. driver for me. The point I'm making, though, is that when I think about the future, I think mm. about being well, about being not only health-wise, yeah. but in my mind. Talk about maybe your evolution and new frontier, but I think, yeah, hearing you talk about Zumba, yeah, that's the stuff that keeps you vibrant and alive. And I love your point because what I hear from a lot of clients or when I do workshops, there's a pervasive feeling of I'm busy now, but I have these ideas of ways I want to live. What they sound grandiose or not, does matter. But the idea is that they're going to wait to do it, for example, until they retire. That's super common, oh, right? Oh. When I retire, I'm going to, that's when I'm going to travel or yeah. that's when I'm going to take that class or that's when I'm going to go and visit my daughter on the East Coast or all the things we we put off. And of course, by now where I'm going to take this, it's that first of all, you might not have, you may not be around by the time you quote unquote retire. But where I actually see it playing out more often is what you're hinting at, because this is your wellness pillar, 
is that how is it going to be for you if you wait and you book your trip to go visit your daughter on the East Coast, but your hip is hurting you so badly that you actually can't even walk around any of the sites with her. You have to basically be at home or her home. And so we do take our health for granted and we can improve our feeling of aliveness by how we look after ourselves with movement and our nutrition. Of course, it's hugely controllable as you have alluded. I like your doctor's quote about 60%, but I'm just back to the point of, oh boy, don't wait. Start to do stuff now that you think you might want to do later. Here's an example. I met someone last week who said he lived with his partner in Phoenix for almost ever. I don't know how long, doesn't matter. But he said, our dream was always to retire in Palm Springs. And then we started to say to ourselves, okay, we're not ready to retire yet, maybe lifestyle wise or financial wise, but why are we waiting to retire before we move to this place we want to move? Why don't we just move there now and still work and live our lives? But then we're one step closer to our version of paradise, whatever they had contrived. That's an example to me of start to live life now the way that you think you might fathom it, because we don't always have the luxury of time or you don't always have the luxury of your health to be able to be mobile, moving around. That's very true. You know what you said about the hip thing? Yeah. My grandmother, Mama, I know when she was alive, you know, I would call her when I was in college just to say hello on a Saturday. And I would say, hi, Mama, I know it's Jeanette. And she said, oh, good to talk to you. And I said, how are you doing? And she said, oh, my hip pained me so. It was always oh. paining herself. <laughs> Talk about the hip, it reminded me of Mama Ina. But you are oh. right about that, why wait? I had that thought. My mm -hmm. company moved me to Arizona about, I don't know, about 20 years ago. And I lived okay. in Arizona and I did my thing there for them. And then they said, Jeanette, we would like you to assume another position in Indiana. So yes. I left Arizona kicking and screaming. In fact, wow. when the movers came, the last piece of furniture was my lawn chair in the backyard because I was like, I don't want to leave the desert. It was like, I'm sorry, we have to pack it up. And I was like, oh my God. So I went ahead, I moved to Indiana and it was a good experience. I've always mm. loved the desert and I really want to go back. And then one day we got an announcement that we all were to attend a meeting where the vice president was to make an announcement. He says, we are reorganizing. Yeah. All of you in this department will have to interview for a new position. There will be four locations, Illinois, Texas, Georgia, and Arizona. You know what I did? I said, I am going to get that Arizona position because that is where I want to be. And four months later, I got the call saying, Jeanette, we've selected you for the position in Tempe, Arizona. So my company moved me out there. I didn't know where I want to be. I want yeah. to be in the desert. And that's exactly where I ended up. What a cool story. There are so many people that I know that have inklings about where they'd like to be. Even if it's not a forever move, that I'd love to spend at least a couple years living along the water or a cabin somewhere. And we have notions. Space and place is really important to our well-being. So some people really do know that it, the mountains do it for them, or it's this the beach, or it's somewhere foresty, whatever it is. Most people have an inkling about where they might come alive, but then we tell ourselves stories about why we can't move there or why it can't happen. And I really respect that financially speaking, not everybody is going to get a second or third home. That's very fine and fair. But we can transplant ourselves, we right? Can. We can make these things happen that we get caught up in all the reasons why it's going to be hard or why it maybe won't work. And yet the people that I work with who are the most fulfilled next to people who've had those near-death experiences, but that's unrealistic for most of us. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody to come close to death in order to really save her life. But it's the people who have initiated change in their life that wasn't easy. And this goes back to that idea about we're going to debunk toxic positivity because this isn't about always looking for the easy way out and things to be fantastic. It's about saying, I really want to find a way to live in London, England. And it's it's not going to be a cakewalk to get there. But if I just for some reason feel super compelled to be there for at least a couple of years of my life, how do I find a way to get there? And when you get there, and so back to examples of clients who have found the way to get to where they want to go or change the career, because you can insert all sorts of variables here, right? It doesn't have to be where you move. It can be they really wanted to change careers and go back to school and become a teacher, or they really wanted to divorce and then leave the relationship that was severely languishing and find new love again. And all of these 
these things, and these are just a few examples, the examples are countless, but when you take the initiative and do something that is not easy, but it's worth it to engage in playing in the game of life rather than sitting on the sidelines, it always ends up being worth it. And I am being literal. It always does for people. There's not a single person I spoke with who has said, back to the conversation about regrets, I regret that I moved to London for two years. Some people might say it wasn't my favorite, but that led me to move actually to Hungary where I met my love of my life. And then that led me to X, Y, Z. And so we regret the things we didn't do, not the things that we did that we wish we just did better. And back to the idea of maybe we do need to shake some things up and give ourselves permission to do it. Even if not, despite the fact that it's going to be hard, I'm actually saying because it's a little bit hard, is that makes it that much more pleasurable when you get there and you say, man, I figured out all that immigration stuff, (laughs) or I managed to somehow transfer my driver's license to this state, even though it wasn't easy. Right. But now I'm here. I'm living the dream. You had the example about Arizona in order to keep it top of mind, almost like manifesting what you wanted to have happen. And I love the idea of not just doing the thing where most of us imagine something that would be cool to do in our lives and then not taking action because we're too busy because we got to go and defrost the chicken for dinner and do all the things we have to do. Some of us write out a bucket list and that can be helpful. Whereas I think taking it up several notches is really stopping. I'm a big fan of if you don't want to do it with a coach and you want to do it with your favorite friend or your partner or someone you just love being around who isn't going to be a joy killer, like squashing your ideas. You can't do that because that's not going to work. Thanks anyways. Be with somebody who is really encouraging and invigorating and share with them. These are the things I would love to do in my life with my remaining Mondays. And then you get to cherry pick. Okay. So when would you do your Spanish immersion life? Huh? Realistically, maybe it would be. And that's when you start to go, maybe it's the first half of 2026. And now you've got a plan. Now everything's moving towards 2026. Now, actually for some people, 2026 with some goals is too far away. For some it's too close, but the point is you got to put a line in the sand and say, this is happening. You talked about ways to snap out of autopilot, you know, the three (laughs) questions to wake you up so that you can start paying attention. Can we talk a little bit about that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Cause autopilot, it's a real syndrome. We really fall into it because we do engage in routines. So the way I think of this, the first thing, if you, find yourself in any kind of a zombie zone. First thing is to diagnose the dead zones, which is all the domains and facets of your life. Some are pretty darn okay, right? You may be like, my social life is hopping. That's great. But you may know that your R&R, like your hobbies and your fun, maybe that's a little flatlined. And then that's where, okay, I have to diagnose and stop and say, that's the spot that's dead. If I could rekindle some of those hobbies or maybe join a class or take that sketching course or re-engage and find a way to have more fun again in that way. So diagnosing where your life is flatlined, and it could be just to really quickly refresh the parts of life. It could be your work life, which is super common for that to be dead. It could be your health. It could be your social life. It could be your love life. It could be your spirituality. It could be growth. Like maybe you're feeling like you haven't really learned anything new or exciting lately. It could be what we just talked about around recreation. And the list can go on different people in different ways, like family and friends, I think I mentioned under social. So diagnose where things are feeling not so lively. Number two, shake things up. So being an autopilot is traditionally brought on when we engage in habits and routines that just put us into just this repeat, repeat zone. And there can be benefits, of course, to being in a habit. It it can really help us, especially if you're establishing a habit, for example, of I want to go to Zumba class every Thursday night and I need to get into this habit. Then you make a routine and you do it. And then once you have the routine down though, then we need to shake things up because human beings thrive off of novelty. And when we don't have novelty, we do tend to get into this sort of ho-hum existence. And we need to take any kind of routine you have, whether it's your morning routine of getting ready, shake it up right? What if you woke up two hours early and you got up and you meditated for 20 minutes, try not falling asleep, and you read or you went out for a walk or you called a friend in a time zone that was conducive, shake it up. I don't know about you, but you ever get into the rut with the same meals that you make again and again, like tonight's the salmon night, or now it's going to be the chicken on the salad. And so an example then of spicing that up even is, hey, we keep talking about trying that new restaurant down the street that maybe could be terrible, but in my mind, even if it's terrible, it's hilarious because you'll laugh about it later, but shaking up 
your usual routines of any kind of workout you do or the food you eat or the people you engage with or even the TV shows you watch or the types of books you read? Do you have the same date night routine, the Sunday routine, the same? You don't have to shake it up all the time. Okay. Guys, we have to have some level of, you talked about peace and a yeah. sense of calm in our lives. We need homeostasis, but we need to sprinkle in a little bit of spice every now and then. And so let's do that. And then my last recommendation for autopilot is to count your Mondays left. And I know we're not going to force you to do it. I will not be that person. But for most of us, even if we have an inkling, we let things ride when we have a little bit of a false sense of security that there's runway to ride on. Oh, runway. See, you know what? We need to be friends. I just talked about runway with my girlfriend, Jackie, because we have parents who are of a certain age. And we acknowledge that my words exactly, that there is not as much of a runway ahead of them. But then we also reflect on where we are. And that might be the reason why we actually have a different perspective. Well, you're hitting on part of theories they've come up with in the psychology science, which is that our priorities, of course, they change as we age. So when we're younger, we really are interested in novelty more so than what I'm recommending. It's easier to have novelty when you're 21 and all you want to do is go to a different bar every weekend or be with a different partner every weekend or whatever. But as we age, we naturally start to want to get a little more of a connection like meaningful yes. social time, like what you're describing, yes. wanting to spend time with those friends that live far and wide and, and finding that sense of meaning out of what we're doing, because there's just a different kind of poignancy as we age. And we start to see that the runway, the horizon on the runway is all of a sudden it's within sight. Now we know we need to put on the right glasses to see it, but we can see it. Whereas obviously when we're younger, it's like, I'm going to live forever. Jody, I read this quote. The persistent anticipation of death is what puts a fine point on the purpose of our lives. Yep. Existential psychologists. I love those guys. Anything existential, sign me up. So back to the autopilot zone. If we continue to regularly contemplate the inevitable and talk about it with people, be aware of it, do the countdown, get clear on, hey, I said that these seven things would be really neat in my life if I did get to do before I did move on, then I may not have the luxury of time. And so I might as well get on with the luxury of experience. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Even the question that you pose about what would be in your book of mm -hmm. have, should have, would have caused me to pause. We've mm -hmm. talked a little bit about what are some of the things that you really want to do, but you haven't done that type of thing, or what would be in that book? Yeah. You really have to give that some thought. Yeah. I find research studies fascinating because I often wonder, like, how does it feel to be one of those guinea pigs? And so one of the ones they looked at a whole host of people who were very senior, and it was called the Life Revision Index. And they said, these are people that we think are near the end. So reflect back, please. And tell me, what would you revise in your life if you could, if you had the beauty and benefit of being able to do a replay? What would you do? And most people inevitably had the comment, I wouldn't work so much. Yeah. Easier said than done when you're caught up in the whirlwind of it. But that's why we do need to pause and stop and go, what really is important again? There's a gentleman, former client, now friend, ran a successful business and had prostate cancer and beat it. But then it came back and he had his prostate removed. And that for him was his wake up call to say, well, I think I'm going to sell my part of the business. And I think I'm going to depart that part of my life. And he actually still is consulting with them, which is the perfect blend of feeling productive, but also I get to do what I want when I want. And what he wants when he wants is visiting with his friends and his family and getting involved in the arts community where he lives. And that for him is a life well lived. And he wouldn't have initiated that, to be honest, unless he'd had the health scare. And again, back to us, let's not let a health scare be the thing that wakes us up to life. Yeah, that's the thing I have been thinking about ever since I read about some of the work that you do and the mm -hmm. clients that you work with and your testimonials. My God, mm -hmm. I read through your testimonials as well. And you've changed a lot of mm -hmm. lives and impacted and influenced a lot mm -hmm. of the outlooks of your clients. Some of them are working, some are executives, some are entrepreneurs. Or some are trying to make the decision if they move on to the next chapter and what to do with that time. So it was very yeah. evident to me that the work that you're doing is very important work. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, it is changing a lot of lives and mm -hmm. uh, it's important. So as we kind of wrap things up, my platform is about the next chapter. And one of the mm -hmm. things that I say is that my show features a kaleidoscope of guests. 
yours was so profound to me in terms of what do you do with the time that you have? Oh, yes. And in that quiz around how alive or dead are you, I find that a lot of women fall into the category called meaningfully bored. And mm -hmm. that's because they have meaning in their life that is often derived from rearing the children, right? And maybe some of the work they do, but they do feel bored because they're not infusing their own life with enough vitality and things that make them feel more energized and oxygenized and alive. And the funny thing about this, it's actually not funny at all. It's entirely unfunny, is that the first exercise is to say, okay, what are some of the things that make you happy? And I know by now that it's actually a trick question because most of the women, and you're right, it is more gendered towards women, more of a caregiving role. Most of these women will look like a deer in the headlights because they actually have totally lost touch with what even makes me happy. What's one activity that might bring you joy if you had a Saturday morning to yourself? And that to me is like a fantastic opportunity to go, oh, let's just wake you up to it again. Let's get in touch with just one or two things. And they can be again, small. This isn't about on your Saturday morning, like flying to Vienna. This is about what if it meant that you got to go and sit at that local coffee shop and you brought East of Eden and you sat there and you ordered a hot chocolate because when was the last time you had a hot chocolate and you sat and you read and you tried not to look at the text messages from your kids and you just sat and you read it and you and you enjoyed and then you took a couple notes about ideas on things. That's an example of just infusing your life with one more little thing. And so is that going to make somebody who feels meaningfully bored a little bit less bored? You know what? Maybe because we underestimate the impact of the little increments of time that it takes to actually experience joy. But that example I just gave you of maybe an hour at the coffee shop reading and feeling and people watching maybe kicking back and just chatting with barista. Like that might be a thing that makes someone's entire Saturday feel so much better. And then they're in turn, a better mom, a better partner, a better friend. Yeah. It doesn't have to be anything grand. You're right. And there needs to be a bit of reframing around permission granted to spend some time doing the things that bring you joy. And that takes a little bit of time for some, but once people start to get a little taste of it again and see that, oh, this isn't selfish. This is actually, I'm being a great role model for my kids, showing them that mom can go out and to go to pottery class and or mom's happier when she has spent time with her friends again. And that makes me a better mom. So there's a little bit of a reframing and relearning and then it's always worth it. I think so. I think so. So as we start to wrap things up, what's next for you in terms of your business? Thanks for asking. I am doing the delightful thing right now of writing a book and it's, oh, it's really exciting. And so that is occupying a lot of my time and energy in a really good way. So the book and then more speaking in front of audiences and doing workshops, helping groups and teams figure out ways to liven up their lives, liven up their team if it's more of a corporate thing. But mostly let's get on with the business of living. So more speaking, more writing, and ah, that's a life well lived to me. Amen and amen. We will definitely put all of your contact information in the show notes. I want to keep up with you because again, oh. you are very unique. Thank you. I feel the same looking at you and we are staying connected because like you're too cool to not be connected. Here's the thing. You're one of the most self-aware people I've talked to in ages. That's one of the reasons I'm loving our conversation is you get it. And you know what? On, I'm going to be listening to your podcast and then we'll stay connected and they'll find out how much lively your life really is. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. I've just loved chatting with you and we could go on for hours. We're going to meet up in real life somehow, and we're going to have a real live interaction. In the meantime, we'll just be connected. You made my day meeting with you. You're just a delight and to be continued. Jody, I'll make sure to check for any updates on your website, 4000mondays.com. Thanks again. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Next Chapter Experience. If you have already subscribed, rated, and left a review, or shared this podcast with a friend, many, many thanks. For questions, comments, or feedback, reach out to me at Jeanette Lissette at nextchapterexperience.com. We'll be back with more conversations, so until then, keep that fire burning.